to On the Water and in the Field, Cornell Cooperative Extension Marine Program's news magazine show. I'm your host, Kimberly Barber. On today's show, we're heading to Shelter Island to get an update on our habitat and shellfish restoration efforts underway thanks to a grant from the town's Community Preservation Fund. Then we'll head over to Tiana Bayside facility to meet Tiana Turtle and learn about this unique public art and awareness installation. Next up, we'll learn about some important research being conducted in support of the regional hard clam population. Finally, we'll get an update on our Back to the Bays initiative and check in with our 2023 featured artist, Scott Bluedorn. So hang on, and here we go. We've arrived on Shelter Island, where CCE Marine Program has been conducting an extensive effort to expand shellfish and habitat restoration in support of water quality improvement. Let's learn more and meet some of the supporters and collaborators working with us on this project. We are at Dickerson Creek on Shelter Island. This site is where we have our remote setting tank for our Shelter Island stewardship site for the Back to the Base initiative. Um, and what that means is we have a tank that we fill with oyster shells and then add oyster larvae, uh, as well as the algae that they love to eat. And within a few days, th that oyster larvae sets onto the shell and that is how we create spat on shell oysters. And that is a major step for how we restore oyster reefs. I was able to work um, very closely with town board members to, and Bayman uh, to find the right locations for all of the work that we're trying to do, whether it's the set tank here at Dickerson Creek or the uh, spout and shell oyster reef in Cockles Harbor, among other restoration activities that we're, we're doing here on, for the island. So it's just a lovely spot where people can come and learn about what we're doing and enjoy the beautiful surroundings. Last year, 2022, we were able to do a pilot project here on Shelter Island and started our spat on shell oyster reef in Cockles Harbor. After doing, you know, some outreach and speaking with the, the town board members and community members and the Water Quality Improvement Committee members, we were able to secure $200,000 of CPF Water Quality Improvement Funds to continue and expand this restoration work. So that means increased hard clam seedings as well as bay scallop seedings in spawner sanctuaries, which will help enhance the um, natural stocks in those waterways that we're, we're going to be seeding, as well as the spat on shell oyster reef, which not only improves water quality, but also offers significant and very important marine habitat for crabs and fin fish. We will also be doing, working with our habitat team to plant eelgrass shoots. And the whole idea of this project is, it's not just a single year, but we're receiving support from the town that shows that they care about the work we're doing and we will continue. This is a long-term investment. The way that one produces shellfish in a hatchery, it starts in the winter time. We bring in adult shellfish and we start conditioning them. We feed them lots of food and we increase the water temperature. And then in a controlled setting, we are ready to spawn them, which means we put them in a bath and the males release the sperm, the females release the eggs. And within a couple hours, you see cell division. And then by the next day, you see swimming larvae. In two weeks, the larvae are ready to set, which, um, for clams and scallops, it, they don't permanently set to anything. They're able to continue to move around. So it just means they're getting to a stage of going from larvae to juvenile shellfish. Oysters, however, and this is an important facet of how, of how we're creating oyster reefs, oysters permanently adhere to a substrate and they prefer to look for other oyster shells. So you would get this 3D reef structure setting on to, uh, oysters setting on to shells and then growing eventually and creating this reef structure much like coral reefs a, a big part of our oyster reef restoration work is the shell so how do we get all the shell uh, we have started a robust shell recycling program 
There's a number of restaurants on Shelter Island as well as on the North Fork and South Fork that are participants. So Kate Sheehan came out to us over the winter and asked us if we'd like to partake in uh, this Back to the Bay program where we recycle our shells from our, our uh, raw bar and our clams and all that stuff. And Kate comes in and uh, collects these buckets of all of our shellfish and then she takes them back out to the water and, and grows these seeds on, on top of these shells that we use from salt, uh, which is just a phenomenal program. We're really, really excited to be getting behind it with her and, and we hope to grow even more throughout the years with Kate. Instead of throwing them out and having them go to a landfill, we receive this valuable material we bring them to uh, Sylvester Manor here on Shelter Island as an official partner. They've allowed us space in their back field to cure the shells, which means they sit for six to 12 months in the elements to dry and become clean. And um, that is per DEC regulations actually to ensure that we're not going to be introducing any um, diseases or foreign species. We had a great group show up to help bag the oyster shells at Sylvester Manor. We decided that we would, we could and should be a repository for uh, shells. Uh, we're a farm, we have over 100, and, over 100 acres of working farmland and there's no reason why a very, very small piece of that couldn't be put towards uh, curing shells and helping in the process. And we partner with Cornell Cooperative Extension on a lot of things on the farm side. Uh, our compost program, um, we've consulted with them on livestock, on the vegetables and fruit that we grow, so this seemed like a natural. Our entire property borders the creek, Gardner's Creek, which is right behind me, uh, and uh, part of our mission is to improve and protect the water quality. So today we're going to have volunteers come down and we're going to remove the bags from the tank and then drive them over to our Cockles Harbor uh, oyster reef site, take all of the shells, the spat on shell, out of the bags, put them in fish totes. We are going to get a total volume and then take one liter samples and each group is going to um, measure and count the spat, the baby oysters, in their one liter sample and that data will help me then understand how many oysters we're putting out into the water what the volume of that shell is going to be so that when I monitor um, in a few months and next year and I can check the survival and growth rate, um, we can then report to the town and say, yes, this is working. We planted last year, oh, look, cool. that was the original, this is the original oh, shell that it sat, sat on and now it has surpassed the shell that it was growing oh, on. that's wow. awesome. <laughs> awesome. Education is a guiding principle for Sylvester Manor. Uh, we educate young people, we educate older people, uh, we are constantly educating ourselves, especially when it comes to farming, when it comes to uh, taking care of the environment. We have an apprenticeship program specifically for our farmers where we're educating the next generation of farmers. We take that very seriously. Uh, and I think this Back to the Bays program and our participation in it is a real part of that. Um, again, it's the big reason why we were, I think, close partners and allies of Cornell Cooperative Extension because education runs through everything that we do. And I think it's just a fantastic model that can continue to build and grow. Um, it's also a great way to, uh, inter to interact with uh, restaurants and other people that may not know that much about Sylvester Manor. Uh, and educate them about what we do and if they don't already know about what Cornell Cooperative Extension does. One unexpected um, and pleasant surprise uh, as far as the educational component goes is through the restaurant involvement with the Shell Recycling Program. We are engaging with the next tier of community members. That restaurant community is that, that next level. For example, um, those restaurants that participate in the Shell Recycling Program, people I know have, have um, you know, gotten really behind it, going through the trouble of reserving the shells for me. And then I've, I've gotten notifications that they've gone and helped out at other restaurants and they've said, hey, we need buckets here. We can't throw out this valuable material. Um, so, so that understanding of the importance of what we're doing is really, um, has been, a nice thing to see.
And I'm really happy that this program's starting because you can see the nitrates in the water and people are, are so concerned about water quality right now, especially being on Long Island and Shelter Island. It is the number one concern for us. Um, so it's important to get behind that program, as a, not just as a business owner, but as a resident as well. Thank you, Kate, the Town of Shelter Island officials and Water Quality Improvement Advisory Board members who supported this project, and to our restaurant partners in Sylvester Manor for playing an essential role in our shell recycling efforts. Now let's check in at Tiana Bayside facility in Hampton Bays, where a new art installation has arrived. Long Islanders love sea turtles, and when the New York Marine Rescue Center releases rehab turtles back to their home, people come out in droves. <laughs> The New York Marine Rescue Center uh, was created in 1996 as the Riverhead Foundation. Prior to that was known as Okinos Foundation. In 2019, we have a DBA for the New York Marine Rescue Center. We are a rescue and rehab organization for sea turtles and seals. And then as well, we provide infield response to dolphins, porpoises, and small tooth whales. Hi, my name is Carolyn Monaco. I am a local Hampton Bays resident and an artist. I work for Cornell Cooperative Extension's Marine Program. The turtle statue came to us through New York Marine Rescue Center and they reached out to Cornell Cooperative Extension because they know the work that we do locally here at Tiana Bayside and um, there's the connection because the Marine Rescue Center does a lot of their releases right here across the water and they thought it would be a great working relationship that we can have, a partnership. About um, three years ago or so we had received some grant funding to um, create these sculptures, these sea turtle sculptures to help advertise and promote and educate the public on sea turtles being in the New York waters. And so we had collaborated with six towns, um, Southampton being one of them, and Southampton coordinated with Cornell Cooperative to actually um, work with someone to paint that sculpture and then put that sculpture up. And I was given freedom to paint whatever I, would, I wanted, and I thought being that we're here at Tiana Bayside as an educational facility, I thought it would be really a great idea to take advantage of the fact that turtles love eelgrass and seagrass and not many people know but right here behind Tiana Bayside there's a whole bunch of eelgrass beds naturally and then also we're doing a lot of restorative work to bring in more eelgrass to encourage habitat restoration. Originally I had planned on putting um, people's word about turtles and eelgrass and the connection that they have with our local marine environment. I was going to put them on the plates of the turtle so that you could see, you know, everybody's poem or whatever, written word sentences, but I've changed my mind. I thought it was important so to see visually the eelgrass and all the different species that are reliant on eelgrass. My thought now is to get the community involvement is to have their words put down on the underside, which is kind of neat because it gets people to really go around the whole entire turtle and see what's going on. It's teaching us the relationship between the sea turtle and the eelgrass and all the other species that live within the eelgrass and how important that is, the, that relationship. It's so fantastic for us to be able to have a turtle statue at Tiana on the Bayside. Um, Southampton Township has been such an incredible supporter of ours for several years, um, always allowing us to do our releases there throughout the year, um, working so quickly in the permit office and we truly appreciate that support and so it's great for us to be able to be there um, all summer and you know early spring doing sea turtle and seal releases at the ocean side um, at Tiana and then having that sculpture there on the bay side. It's all about respect. Got to take care of take care of what we have and you know just a simple word respect means so much. Beautiful work painting Tiana turtle, Carolyn. What a great awareness project in support of our local sea turtles and their habitat. New York Marine Rescue Center does so much to support these amazing creatures. Thanks for all you do, and we encourage you to learn more about the Tiana Turtle Collaboration on our website. Moving on from turtles to hard clams, let's check in on research efforts being conducted to selectively breed these bivalves and create a more resilient clam population.
Mercenaria mercenaria, or hard clam, is a very important species for the health of the economy and the marine food web. Growers along the eastern seaboard experience mortality-related loss in their hard clam inventory for several reasons. In northern areas, the pathogen known as Quahog parasite, unknown, or QPX, creates problems on shellfish farms from Massachusetts to Virginia. In Florida, heat stress during the summer can result in mortalities of larger clams reaching harvest size. These events result in lost revenues for growers. Thus, the Sea Grant Hard Clam Selective Breeding Collaborative, Hub, aims to improve the aquaculture industry on the Atlantic coast by finding and establishing more resilient lines of clams. Yeah, we're talking about growers, uh, hard clam farmers on the East Coast, and that's what this project's really for. Keep in mind that New York does not have very many hard clam farmers, but all, pretty much all towns in Nassau and Suffolk have hard clam programs, where they either have a hatchery or a nursery, they buy hard clam seeds put out for the public. And some of this research is definitely germane to that as well, especially the QPX part, uh, where we're looking at disease, because we can get diseases when the clams are kept close together. And by the way, there are a number of oyster farmers that are looking to diversify their crops and get into hard clam farming. Uh, hard clams have uh, really come up in value over the past few years. Not rivaling oysters, but there's a market for them and uh, they are wanted in the market. Researchers have been studying the clam's genome for the identification of naturally occurring strains that are resistant to these stressors. Now, what is a genome? A genome is all the genetic information stored in DNA that describes a living organism, and this genome makes us who we are. So why is it so important to study the, the genome of the hard clam? That's how we're gonna get at the traits and how we can select for those best traits. And it'd be really easy to take a sample of a clam once we get that you know, the genome down, like we have for humans, by the way, and find out what gene allows them to survive heat stress better or this QPX parasite that, that affects clams in culture conditions primarily. So that's the main reason, yeah, to make, to make a better clam. The genome is key for allowing scientists to identify parts of the DNA that control responses against QPX disease and heat stress. The method being deployed identifies an exact location, also known as a genetic marker, on a chromosome that controls specific traits. A trait is the expression of a gene, and this can have physical, metabolic, or immune characteristics. Seemingly minor variations in these genetic markers can create major differences in traits. A team of researchers has successfully completed the first steps to identify these genetic variations at the DNA level within the clam genome that controls response to QPX disease and heat stress. Scientists have sequenced the hard clam genome and discovered millions of small variations in DNA called single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs. Genetic selection is expected to be more precise and efficient than traditional selective breeding. This selective breeding will produce genetic improvements so hard clam growers can reproduce these specific traits in future generations of their crops. Right, after a number of generations, we want to be able to take these clams that we spawn, and when they grow up to be broodstock, to be the parents, male and female clams, we can provide those to hatcheries up and down the coast. Uh, maybe some of them will be more valuable in Florida than say in Massachusetts, which is as far north as we're really going with the project. The, the hatchery, whether it's commercial or municipal like ours here, we can select for a trait that we want. Like I said, we might not care about the heat stress like they do in Florida, but we're gonna care about disease and we're gonna care about fast growth and the shell thickness to keep the predators at bay and to get a plan to market. Many areas of the domestic food industry use selective breeding to increase production. Selective breeding is different from genetically modified organisms, or GMO. GMO usually involves the introduction of foreign genes that didn't exist previously, whereas selective breeding is based on naturally occurring variations already in the organism. There is still more work to be done, but we hope to soon identify resilient strains that would improve clam farm viability, and from this, ensure the availability of high quality seed to growers. And keep in mind that New York is, out of the five participating states, we are the lowest production in terms of hard clams of those five, and actually more than that on the East Coast. Uh, and it has to do with a lot, a lot of factors. That being said, I think 
This project can help jumpstart the commercial farming industry on Long Island and get more people that are either growing oysters now or just want to grow clams in the future. I think it's going to help jumpstart that. And it could be in the next five years. So we'll see. Hopefully all of this great research will help in combating the impacts of disease and temperature on hard clams. Great work, Sea Grant, and the CCE collaborators working on this important effort. Before we wrap up this episode, let's get an update on what our Back to the Bays initiative has been up to this year, and learn more about all the programming and involvement opportunities that have been part of this year's Ways to Give Back to the Bays campaign. It's been another great year for our Back to the Bays initiative, and we've made amazing progress on our shellfish and habitat restoration work and expanding our educational stewardship session offerings as a way to engage the public in this important work. Thank you to all of our members and volunteers who have showed such a high level of support of all of our efforts. As our oyster reef stewardship sites expand, so does our need for recycled shell to support our spat on shell operation. Our Back to the Bay Shell Recycling Network is going strong with new partner additions, Eddie's at Silver Sands Motel, and Cowfish joining our lineup this year. We've been having a great time this summer popping up at these partner locations who have been hosting our Back to the Bay's Oyster Happy Hours. These events will be continuing monthly, so we hope to see you at one soon. We've also been enjoying our monthly marine program lecture series at various breweries throughout the East End. So far this year, our talented staff has presented on a variety of topics from bay scallops to seahorses. We still have a few more lectures to go this year, and we've been archiving the recorded lecture sessions on our website, so check out backtothebays.org slash lectures to get caught up. You may have met some of our Back to the Bays interns this summer at these events, and they were also busy working behind the scenes in our shellfish hatchery and out in the field with CCE staff. Thank you to Sophie, Joanna, Kaya, Lane, Jackie, Fiona, Lily, Peter, Anna, and Madeline for all your hard work this summer. You could check out our On the Water and in the Field blog for some great behind the scenes accounts of their experiences. We would like to thank our collaborators who are continually supporting our work through the proceed-generated sales of everything from bandanas, or shall we say clamdanas that the Calamity Janes designed, to custom marine-inspired jewelry pieces by Mana Maid, cast from actual shellfish from our hatchery, and the beautiful oyster dishes created with reclaimed shell by Gene Stedman. And of course, we have our continued partnership with Borghese Vineyards, who produced another vintage of Rosé for the Bays to benefit our programming this time with our featured artist, Scott Blue Dorn's work on the label. His artwork can be seen on all of our event and membership materials this year. We recently sat down with Scott to learn more about his process and inspiration behind his nature-based creations. Yeah. I grew up in East Hampton and I've always been painting, drawing uh, primarily and I've been really just influenced by the natural environment that I've always been surrounded by, whether that's at the beach or in the forests or on ponds and paddle boarding or beach combing, all the above, all these things kind of created a world for me to explore via my art and it's always been a natural process for me. So I'm sitting here in my new studio space, which I'm so glad to have, and uh, I'll be showing my work throughout the summer. Um, I have a small show of uh, specifically marine-inspired work at the East Hampton Town Marine Museum on Bluff Road in Amagansett, uh, including all the original paintings I did for Cornell. And uh, that's been really fun to work with them and their collection. I drew directly from their collection and, and was kind of playing with my existing work. Uh, and then I'll be working with Cornell with uh, some fun workshops, uh, outings, um, kind of connecting with the public and seeing, you know, all these different interests and how they might combine taking the art and the environment and making really something beautiful out of it. Living on the East End, we have this really amazing uh, tradition of the arts. Um, we have so many artists that are attracted here, not because just because of the natural surroundings, but the light has always been one of these primary drivers for painters of light and, and those that appreciate um, the, the open space here. Uh, the East End has these amazing landscapes that are uncommon and really almost anywhere else. You have these 
uh, farm fields right by the ocean, you have sand dunes, uh, we have these very uh, intact ecosystems that are they're rare and they're also really pretty beautiful to immerse yourself in and I think where we live is extremely unique and special for that reason. I got involved with Cornell I think initially with my interest with kelp and kelp farming as kind of a new uh, industry for the East End. Uh, I've been involved with water quality uh, issues for a long time. It's really close to my heart as a surfer and water person and uh, Cornell has been leading kind of the way in terms of um, aquaculture and best practices and Back to Bays is this amazing program that is kind of all of the above and uh, it's amazing that you partner with the artists uh, to further each uh, to further each side so I like to use my art as a communication tool so the Back to the Bays program um, they, it really kind of came together as this uh, nice collaboration. Art is a really great platform for raising awareness about all si kinds of issues um, because it has an emotional aspect to it that science communication might not always get across. Um, the language of science is mathematics and graphs and these kind of things are useful from a data standpoint but they don't really get to the core of people's emotional uh, connection to the environment, to the, to the world and uh, art I think opens up a, a portal for seeing things um, on a metaphysical sense so what you can't get out of a book or what you can't get from um, say a graph or a study uh, art really cuts to the core of uh, an emotional experience I think and it's really important for that reason. Well water quality is you know really one of the most important things I think that everyone should be thinking about and at this critical time uh, unfortunately we have many water bodies that are really quite impaired so this kind of education and program is one of the most important things that I think that can be happening right now in terms of environment health and human health. So we should all be thinking about it all the time. We invite you to join us at our upcoming collaborative art and science programming with Scott and to keep up with all of our opportunities to learn, do, enjoy, and give back in support of our bees. You could check out the events calendar on our website, or even better, become a member so you receive our update emails on all the great things happening throughout the year. Let's give back and get back to the bays. Thanks, Scott, for your incredible renditions of our key back to the bays species, and to all of our interns, volunteers, and program participants who have come out in support of our back to the bays efforts this year. Looking forward to more good things on the horizon, and of course we'll feature them in future episodes of our show. That does it for today though, so see you next time on the water and in the field.